We're talking about block ciphers where we take a sequence of bits, a block of bits, B bits, and we encrypt that block of bits at a time applying some encryption algorithm and we get B bits of ciphertexts out. And the a key is used to determine what particular ciphertext will come out. Changing the key should produce a different ciphertext. We want our ciphertext to be random. Encryption should produce random output, or sometimes I say random looking, because sometimes we need to define what we mean by random. So plain text is structured. There's some structure in the plain text. We'd like random ciphertext as output. We said that our cipher, our algorithm, must have reversible mappings. That is, when we encrypt our plain text, the ciphertext that we get as an output we should be able to decrypt that ciphertext to get back to the original plaintext. So the one on the right, in irreversible mapping, is not good because if I encrypt plaintext 10, I get ciphertext 01. And if I encrypt plaintext 11, I also get ciphertext 01. So if I want to decrypt ciphertext 01, I don't know what the plaintext was. So that's, we need a reversible mapping. And we talk about an ideal block cipher, but uh, uh, what we can think of, what we'd like a block cipher to do is to be able to allow any possible transformation of our plain text to cipher text and in fact do random transformations. And we went through an example. Uh, here's a, we went through an example, I'll bring it up. with a simple block or a small block size and this example that you had said if our block is two bits then there are 24 possible transformations of those two bits of plain text and we listed them there all 24 so with two bits of plain text there are four possible plain text inputs to our cipher and there are 24 possible transformations of that to the power of 2 factorial. In effect, we can think of each transformation as a key. So what we would do if we were to use such a cipher is that we would choose one of those 24 transformations. I may choose transformation number 17, or K17. And what would happen is when I encrypt my plain text 00, zero with transformation number 17, the output ciphertext would be 1, 1. Okay, so the transformation corresponds to a key. So that's one way we can implement a block cipher. And that's what we call an ideal block cipher. We allow every possible transformation. Another example is on the lecture slide. We can view it from a different perspective. This is a 4-bit input. 4-bit plain text. With 4 bits of plain text, there are 16 possible values. So instead of the 4 values that we had, let's say there are 16 possible values. And from an implementation perspective, one transformation could look like this on the, on the slide. So we take our 4 bits of plain text input. Think of that as a number between 0 and 15. Or and each one of those, so the, of the four bits, if the four bits are 0, 0, 0, 0, that's 0 in decimal, and this specific instance or this specific transformation maps this 0 value here and it moves across, I can't see it, I think to 14 and the output would be the binary equivalent of 14. And that's, we'd encrypt the four bits of plain text and get four bits of ciphertext. Those lines that are crisscrossing, that's just some random arrangement of mapping the 16 possible input plain text to 16 possible output ciphertext. This is for one particular key. A different key for this cipher would produce a different arrangement would have the lines crossing in a different manner. 
So that's just a way to think of it, implementation. We take four bits in, we think, well, that, there's 16 possible values, and the cipher maps each of those values to one of the possible 16 outputs, which becomes a four-bit output. That specific instance, so this is a substitution. We substitute, for example, 0 with 14. So if the plain text coming in is in binary four zeros, or in decimal zero, this cipher substitutes zero with the decimal value 14, and we write that out in, in binary as the cipher text. If the input was six, we substitute that with 11. So this is a way to implement a block cipher. But it's only for one key. If we change the key, we'll have a different substitution. Then how many possible substitutions are there? Or how many possible keys? Try and calculate the possible, this is one of them, how many are in total possible transformations or substitutions? 16 factorial, okay? So here we have, there are 16 possible inputs. The number of arrangements of those 16 values is 16 factorial. Anyone have a calculator? 16 factorial. 10 to the power of... <laughs> I have no idea. It's not so big, but we can't calculate it. That's with a 4-bit block cipher, so there are 10 to the power of 13 possible transformations. Fine. If we have a 64-bit input, for example, and we'll talk about why we'd want a 64-bit in a moment, but it's a good size, it turns out, for a block. How many possible transformations? 64 factorial. No? Wrong. If we have a 64-bit plain text block, how many transformations? Two to the power of 64 factorial. So here we have a four bit input. There are 16 or two to the power of four possible values and therefore 16 factorial possible transformations. If we had a 64 bit input instead of four, it will be two to the power of 64. That number factorial. And I might, it won't calculate it, okay? Uh, um, my calculator just won't even attempt to solve it. Uh, very, very large number. So that's, that's good with respect to having many possible combinations, but it's bad in that that's effectively the number of keys that we have. And having many keys is good, but it means that our key length will be very, very large. The key length will turn out to be the best case that we could do it is log base 2 of this number factorial, which is something like um, billions and, and trillions of bits for one key. So it comes to this practical thing that, yes, this is a block cipher is uh, a good way to implement a cipher, but it's impractical in that the key will be too large, too large to distribute to other people, to save, and, and therefore uh, it's not useful to implement a ci cipher like this. So the concept of an ideal block cipher is to allow any possible transformation of our plain text to cipher text. If we have a large block size, the key becomes too large, and in fact implementing such a block cipher becomes very, uh, very hard to do with, with good performance. If we don't use 64-bit blocks, we use like our example, two bits. This one was a two-bit block. The key is quite small. There are only 24 possible values. Well, brute force attack is possible in this case, so we need larger. And also, with small blocks, you start to get repetitions or much more structure in the output. One of the concepts we saw in classical ciphers is that if you can operate on more characters at a time, you can start to hide some of the structure in the plain text. When we went to a Playfair cipher, remember Playfair operates on two, two letters at a time. 
That was a feature of trying to hide the characteristics of letters in the ciphertext. Encrypt two at a time. Similarly, if you encrypt three at a time, it can be better. So encrypt more data at a time can be more secure. So the problems is that we want a s small block for a reasonable key size, but a small block means it's much easier to do an uh, attacks and analysis on the, the output ciphertext. So it turns out ideal block ciphers, we don't implement them in this way. We need some simpler way to do it. These tables are just a, a implementation of this. If you check, what do we say? Zero map to 14. So in binary plain text, zero maps to ciphertext 14 in decimal. That's just a, one view of that particular key. And of course decryption takes us back. So Feistel came up with an idea of structuring block ciphers so we can implement them so that they're secure but we have manageable key sizes. And most of the block ciphers used today are based upon the concepts that the Feistel, what's called the Feistel structure for block ciphers is. And we will not go through the Feistel structure because we'll go through it as an example in DES, the data encryption standard. So we'll see an example of it. I will not try and explain the structure uh, outside of the example. We'll go through the example to, to illustrate the concepts. And the concepts we'll come back to after we go through the example are th important ones of diffusion and confusion. But I'll try and explain confusion through an example and cause a lot of confusion for you and then we'll try and make it clearer at the end. So we'll come back to these after we go th through an example. So the Feistel structure is think of a design principle, a way to design ciphers, a general structure. AES, DES and others follow that structure to some extent. And the idea is about this bottom line. Making our cipher secure in that no one can take the cipher text and find the plain text or the key, but also making the cipher perform well. So that performance includes that we can have a manageable key size, a key that I can distribute to someone easily, and is fast. So when I encrypt a large file, it doesn't take uh, 10 hours to encrypt it. It can happen in seconds or, or less. And in fact, that trade-off comes up all through the course and in computer security. We want things to be secure, but we want them to perform well as well. And they often conflict with each other. So what we're going to do is go through the data encryption standard, not the Feistel structure. This was one of the most, one of the first widely used block ciphers when uh, in computing. Um, it's no longer widely used, but many of the currently used ciphers are either based upon it or use very similar principles to it. So we will explain how DES works and we will not explain other ciphers in as much detail as DES, but uh, they, they follow some of the same principles. The data encryption standard was a standard created by the US government for uh, use within the US government, so between departments to encrypt data, and also as a result, so companies dealing with the US government you needed to use this same standard. And of course, other companies outside of the US started to use it, and it became very widely used in the world. It was developed in uh, the 1970s. Um, designed at IBM with inputs from different people and it's been used in many other ciphers. It operates on a 64-bit block of plain text and produces a 64-bit block of ciphertext and it actually has a 64-bit key. The slide says 56-bit. It turns out the key is 64 bits but only 56 of those 64 are used in the encryption. The other eight are a parity check. So we'll see both numbers used. So DES 
takes as an input a 64-bit key, but effectively from a security perspective, we throw away eight of those bits. So sometimes we talk about a 56-bit key for DES. DES, is, DES, as with many block ciphers, is quite complex. And no need for you to look, but uh, I'll jump through to some of the details. If you want to look at DES, it's all defined on these pictures here with some extra, there's some algorithm, and there's some matrices and so on to define arrangements, and some more sub-algorithms and so on to do within each to iteratively apply, and so many details there that we cannot go through that in the course to explain how it works. In particular, we cannot use an example of here's some plain text and encrypt, because it takes me too long to write 64 bits of plain text and go through an example. So it turns out people have implemented a cut down version of DES, just for education, just for teaching. Simplified DES. And what I'll do is go through and explain how simplified DES works. And it's, it's, I think it's the small version of DES. You'll see instead of using 64 bits of plain text, it uses 8 bits of plain text. So it's not used in the real world, but it's used just to illustrate how DES works. And we'll use it to go through an example of how to encrypt with simplified DES. Then we'll return and compare the two, simplified and real deaths. So I'll explain simplified deaths first. It takes eight bits of plain text and produces eight bits of ciphertext. And the reason for this is that we can actually take an example plain text and encrypt it by hand. We'll do that today. And it takes a 10 bit key. And we'll see that the FISAL structure, DES, and most block ciphers perform some operations and then repeat them to add more security and repeat and repeat. And those uh, repetitions are referred to as rounds. So we, we do something and then we do another round and then another round and so on. In simplified DES, there's only two rounds. You'll see in real DES, there's 16 rounds. So we repeat something 16 times in real DES. Here we just have two. And the things that we do include operations like permutations. Permutations is rearrange bits. In classical ciphers, we call that what operation? A permutation is the same as a transposition. Okay, remember we talk about transposition ciphers? Rearrange something. Transpose, permutate, rearrange. means the same thing. So it uses some permutations. We operate on bits, on binary. We, we'll see some left shifts. What's a left shift? Just shift all your bits to the left but wrap around. So the leftmost bit becomes the rightmost bit. We'll see an example of that. Uh, and we'll see in the details that it also includes some substitutions. So we'll go through the details. Let's go and explain the overall algorithm and then go through an example. There's actually, t well, three parts. There's encryption, decryption, but also there's a key generation algorithm. And the key generation actually takes our original key and splits it or creates two part or two sub keys which are generated upon our original key. So on this picture, the blocks on the left here are the encryption steps. IP will explain what it means. It's a permutation. P generally refers to a permutation some function, which we'll look at in detail, some swap or switch, and another function, and then an initial permutation inverse, so we'll see them. On the right are the blocks for decryption. Note the arrows are going up. And in the middle is how to generate the two, what we have, sub-keys, or sometimes called round keys. 
We start with one key. We're going to apply some operations and create subkey K1 and subkey K2 and use them separately in the encryption and decryption. Look at encryption and decryption blocks. What do you notice about them? The algorithm for encryption and decryption. They are the same. Okay? In, without even understanding what they do, we see this is IP, some function, using K as an input, some, this is a swap or switch the halves, and that, the same function again, then some inverse operation. That's encryption. Take plain text, it will produce 8 bits of ciphertext. Decryption is identical to that. So with the same steps are applied, it just turns out that we use the subkeys in a different order. With encryption, we will generate subkey K1, use that in the first function, and subkey K2 in the second function. With de when we decrypt, in the first function we will use K2, going up, and the second time K1. Maybe the important point there is that encryption and decryption can be implemented the same. If we implement in hardware or software, we just need one implementation. So that we don't need a, piece of, a different piece of software to encrypt and, and decrypt. And that's a nice feature. Before we encrypt or decrypt, we must generate these subkeys. So that's a, think of that as a separate process that we do at the start. So I'm going to go through an example. Uh, I think you have the example printed out. Can I just check through? Just scroll through and I think there should be a simplified desk example in your handouts. Yes, simplified desk. Yes. There's one title, Block Ciphers and Desk, Simplified Desk Example. I'm going to go through that exact one so you can follow it there. Uh, and also I'll flick between the slides to, to illustrate, just to be clear, which... Where was it? If you can't find it, it's this one. Simplified Desk Example. You have it. So what I'm going to do is take some plain text, some key, and encrypt that plain text. And the purpose is not for you to remember all the operations, but just to see those concepts that we've learned in classical ciphers being applied. Takes a bit of time, so let's get started. Uh, first thing we need to do is the, the key generation. The middle blocks in, in the picture. So we start with two inputs, the plain text and the key. And in simplified DES, the plain text is an 8-bit value and the key is a 10-bit value. So I'll write down the key that I've chosen and then later we'll get to the plain text that we want to encrypt. So the key in this, this case K, I've just chosen a, a random 10-bit value. Ten bits, I just include a space there so we can realize that it is ten bits. It's easy to see. What we need to do is take those ten bits and generate two subkeys, or called round keys, because we use them in different rounds of our encryption and decryption. So we'll get as an output K1 and K2. And the algorithm for doing that is illustrated from these five blocks. What we do is we take 10-bit key and apply a permutation. So in these pictures, P refers to a permutation. P10 is defined, and it defines a specific way to rearrange those 10 bits. 
So we just take the 10 bits and, and change the ordering of them. Then we'll do a left shift. The shift operation is a left shift on those bits. So we'll shift them to the left. And then P8 is a permutation that takes 10 bits in and produces a rearrangement of those 10 bits, omitting two of them. So we get 8 bits out. So you can see the shape. You can see 10 bits will come in, 8 bits will come out. We'll throw away two of them. That will produce the round key K1, or the sub key K1. To get K2, we will take the output of the previous shift, do another left shift, and, uh, and apply the same permutation and get K2. So let's do that. To do it, we need to know what is P10. And it's defined here. A permutation just specifies how to rearrange the bits. So if we think of the bits numbered from 1 to 10, the first bit through to the 10th bit, when we apply P10, the way to read it is that the first bit will move into the seventh position. The second bit will move to the third position. The third bit on input will move to the first position on output. It's just a rearrangement of those 10 bits. And it's fixed. So for this simplified desk, it's always this. It's known, the attacker knows this, everyone knows this. We assume the attacker knows the algorithm. And in fact, in real desks, we'll see there's a permutation that's equivalent to this. And again, it's fixed and known, so it's a constant arrangement. It's just longer. Instead of 10 bits, it operates on 64 or 56 bits. Similar, P8, we'll use it in a moment, is a rearrangement of 10 bits, but we throw away two of the bits, the first two, I think. So bit 1 and 2 will be discarded when we apply P8, and we'll get bits 3 through to 10 arranged in that the sixth bit becomes the first bit, and the third bit on the input becomes the second bit on output. So again, this is a fixed rearrangement of the bits. Later in the encryption, we'll see there's also a P4, just another arrangement. So let's try it. We need to apply our permutation P10 on this. So I better try and get it right. What do we get? We'll do this in detail, this one, just to illustrate what's happening. So we can think this is the first, second, and just number those bits. They are our 10 bits in, and we apply P10, the operation, which really rearranges those 10 bits. And we look on the, uh, the picture, and the third bit, sorry, the picture, the, the definition of P10, the third bit of input becomes the first bit. That is, the first bit of output is the third bit of the key, which is 1. And we follow through, it's 35274. Three, It'll get confusing if we do it all the way, but I think it makes sense. The second bit is the fifth bit of the input, which was a zero. The second bit of input becomes the third bit, also a zero. The seventh bit of input becomes a fourth bit, which was a zero. And bit four becomes the fifth bit. And we keep going. We see the next 10, 1, 9, 8, 6.
and one the tenth bit the first bit the ninth bit the eighth and the sixth that's our output of applying P10 Any questions of how to do permutations? It's not the intent for you to have to remember how simplified DES or even real DES works in detail, but just to illustrate some of the operations that they use. Here is a simple rearrangement of bits. It has to be this. It is always this. So you choose a key. If you're using simplified desk, the first thing you do is rearrange it according to this. Okay. And it's the same in real desk. It's fixed. It's known. Uh, why is it this? Well, ask the designers. Okay. But the people who designed it, and we'll see same with the other operations, that well. Supposedly, they had some ideas of what to do, and the principles that they were using to come up with these rearrangements, again, they'll use the principle of permutations or transpositions, substitutions, in the same way that we saw them in classical ciphers and how they can add to the security of things like hiding the statistics of the plain text. So that's one thing they want to do. Uh, Making it hard, later we'll see, making it hard to get the key f even from the ciphertext. So we'll come back and explain not so much why they did it, but the ideas behind doing these things, things like diffusion and confusion and a few other operations. So we'll, at the end we'll come back not only why, but also some tests that show that with this particular operation, the end result is more secure than if we used a different operation. And that is another level of confidence that this operation is a good operation. But we'll return to that once we go through the entire encryption. That was this P10, that's all. So we get, you can think, 10 bits in, 10 bits out. Next is a left shift. Left shift by one position. I don't know if it's designed. Ah, here we go. This is the key generation, these middle five blocks in more detail. And it shows on the lines the number of bits we deal with. So we started with 10 bits in. We applied P10 and we can think what comes out. We separate it into two halves, the left half and the right half. Five bits each. We apply a left shift by one position on each half. So we'll take the first five bits, shift them to the left by one position. Try it now. That is, take this output and apply a left shift. So think of it now as two different sets of five bits. and we apply a left shift on them. Left shift is just another permutation. It's a permutation where bit 2 becomes 1, bit 3 becomes 2, 4 becomes 3, 5 becomes 4, and bit 1 becomes 5. That's all a left shift is. The left bit wraps around to the end. And similar on these five bits. Note that we do the left shift separately on the two halves. So we'll shift bit two to first position, bit three, bit four, bit five, and the first bit becomes the last bit there. So in fact, a left shift is also a permutation.
what's next. Take those two 5-bit inputs, join them together in apply P10. Try it. Uh, sorry, P8. P8 takes 10 bits in and produces 8 bits out. This one. So again, we treat those two sets of five bits as a 10-bit value, and we get eight bits out. Can anyone tell me the values? Always forget looking back. So this is it the sixth bit will come first. So again, six, three, seven, four will be the first four bits. Six, three, seven, and the fourth bit. And you'll keep going and you get zero one zero zero. Okay. We've lost two bits. The first two bits are not used in the output here. This is key one, K1 in our algorithm. The first sub-key or the first round key. We'll use it in the encryption and the decryption. Next, we we'll jump through. That was produced K1 as output. Next, we go back to the output of the two left shifts. So before we applied P8, we take the, each pair of five bits and apply another left shift by two positions. So LS2 means left shift two positions. And then we'll take those 10 bits as output and apply the same P8 again to get K2. The output of P8 in this step was K1. We do a left shift 2 and just to be clear, we take these two values as the input. We don't take P8, the output of P8, we take the previous steps values and a left shift of 2. The 1 here of those five bits is going to move from the fifth position to the third position. And a left shift of two, these two ones are going to end up the end. And then we apply P8 on the, those ten bits. The same P8, so the exact same permutations we applied before. and that is K2. Nothing too complex yet. We've just rearranged those bits to produce two sub-keys. If, if you knew the two sub-keys, you can easily find the original key. There's no complex operations that make it hard to go backwards in this case. Okay? The inverse is, is quite simple. But the idea is that what we're going to do is, because our cipher is broken into rounds, where rounds are really just the same operations, but we, each round we repeat those operations, for each round we use a different subkey. So this is a key generation step. It turns out that the decryptor does exactly the same thing. So if I want to encrypt plain text, I first choose a key, 101000010, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 
and I generate K1 and K2. I will then use them to encrypt my plain text. I'll send you the cipher text. What you will do is you'll take, of course, the same key. This is a shared key crypto system. So you'll take the same 10 bits and you'll apply the exact same steps and therefore you'll get the exact same values of K1 and K2. So the decryptor does this as well. They'll get the exact same values. Now we can try and encrypt. So to encrypt, we need some plain text. Encryption. And I've chosen some plain text. What have I chosen? Let's use the same one. Zero, one, one. This is my block that I want to encrypt. It's eight bits, just a random eight bits. It has no meaning in this example, but uh, suppose it has some meaning. We want to encrypt that and get some ciphertext. So that's the plain text. and go back to the encryption and it's defined in detail here but in the overview it's the left side here what we do is we take 8 bits in apply a permutation it's called an initial permutation because we do it at the start we apply some function so f is some function that function takes as an input a key which key? k1 this function is the first round of our cipher. The output will then get 8 bits out and will swap the halves. So SW stands for swap or switch. That is, we'll swap the two 4-bit halves. Very simple. Then we'll apply the exact same function again, but instead of using K1, we'll use K2, what we just generated. Then we'll do the initial permutation, but the inverse. And that will give us our ciphertext. Initial permutation is also defined. It's here. Again, just a permutation. Fixed, always known, always the same. It's this. The inverse of IP, maybe we'll when we get to it, we'll, we'll say something about that what the value is. Left shift we've seen. We'll see later there's also an expand and permutate which will take four bits in and rearrange them but also duplicate them. So there'll be eight bits out. We'll see that in one of the steps. So these are all permutations so far. So think of the example classical ciphers of the rail fence cipher and the rose column cipher. They were examples of permutations. And one of the problems with permutations is that the frequency of the characters in the plain text is also reflected in the ciphertext. Because we have the exact same number of character or the exact same number of each character in the ciphertext as the plain text. Uh, if you went, went back to our rail fence and rows columns, for example, if we have 12% A's in the plain text using a transposition or permutation, there'll be 12% A's in the ciphertext. They'll just be in different positions. So that's not secure on its own. So later or soon we'll see that there's a substitution somewhere. So this is the details of the encryption. And we'll go through it slowly. At least we'll go through the first half. And the second half is just a repetition in fact. We'll take 8 bits in we'll apply the permutation IP. We'll get 8 bits out, but we'll treat them as two 4-bit halves. The left half and the right half. On the right half, we'll expand and permutate. 4 bits in. See the lines show how many bits. It rearranges and creates 8 bits out. 
We'll XOR that with K1. XOR operation here. And then we'll take the 8 bits out and as four, uh, two 4 bit halves apply some substitutions. So S0 and S1 are some substitutions where we take some of the characters and replace them with other characters from the po all possible characters. So these are the operations like a Caesar cipher, Vision Air and so on which are substitution ciphers. Then we'll do a P4 and then we'll get to you know, it's hard to see on the screen. We'll get to another XOR with the left half. We'll swap those two halves and do it all again. So when we talk about a round, this grey box, the darker grey box, is one round, this function f of k. And this is exactly the same inside here. Same implementation, the same uh, uh, operations. Just have different inputs. K1 in the first round, K2 in the second round. So let's go through just the first half just to illustrate those blocks. This is maybe the only cipher in this course that will go through in depth, in this, this amount of depth. And in fact, it's only a simplified version of a real cipher. Uh, we will not do this for others because in practice the computer does it all for us but we need to understand some of the operations. So the first thing we do is we apply IP and I'm not going to write it here, it's a permutation. We'll take those 8 bits in and we'll arrange them such that the second bit becomes the first bit, the sixth bit, the second bit and so on. Wrong way. Can someone tell me what we get out? I have it somewhere. The second bit will become the first bit. The sixth bit, which was a zero. All right, I can third, three, one, four, eight, the third bit, the first bit, the fourth bit, the eighth bit. Did we get there? Zero, 01. Okay. Confirm, let me know when I make a mistake on here because if we make a mistake here, the entire ciphertext will be wrong at the end and you'll have to go back and fix it. <laughs> Same in the exam. When you do the midterm exam and encrypt, don't make a mistake at the start because you'll get the, the wrong answer and you'll waste all that effort. No. Encrypting, you just get the ciphertext. If you don't get it, then uh, you fail. Security is sometimes a binary thing. That is, if you do it right, it works. If you do it wrong, then nothing works. Okay? So sometimes we need to take care that uh, if you m make a mistake somewhere when you're applying security, then the whole thing can fail. So we apply our initial permutation. What's the next thing? I have to switch through. We split it into halves, the right half and the left half. And we, for now, we only deal with the right half, the right four bits, and we take that into the ex expand and permutate. So we're going to take these four bits for now and apply the expand and permutate, which takes four bits in, Look on the slides and you'll see that it rearranges them but also duplicates. Bits 1, 2, 3, 4 become the fourth bit becomes the first and so on. 4, 1, 2, 3. So the fourth bit was a 1, the first bit, the second and the third bit of the input, 4, 1, 2, 3, and then the next 2, 3, 4, 1. The second bit, so the second bit, we're only dealing with these four, the third, 1, 1. 
What's next? XOR with the key. So we take that K, K1, this value from before. One zero one zero. Zero one oh oh. This is K one. And the operation we do is an XOR, exclusive OR. One and one? All right, you know, easy. When they're the same, we get zero. When they're different, we get one. Get that right? XOR operation on the key and the output of the expand and permutate. Just going back. We're here now. We've just done the XOR. We're now going to split it into two halves again. Four bits at a time. The left four bits are fed into S0. S0, S0, S refers to substitution. This is called an S box. Not an X box, an S box where we, a substitution box. Sometimes the others are called P boxes, permutation boxes. We take it, some input and we'll do a substitution producing some output. And remember, a substitution is that uh, we replace one of our characters with another character from the entire set of characters. When we did it on letters, it was easy to understand. Say, we replaced the letter A with one of the other, tw one of the 26 characters. It doesn't have to be one of the characters in the input that we replace it with. So we take the left half and lead it, use it in S box S0. So we'll have to explain how that S box works. That will go into S0, and we'll do that separately. And this half will go into S1. Now let's look at those S boxes. And these are important parts. That is, this is the main thing that, uh, well, the, the main substitution operation. The XOR is used as well, but uh, this is uh, an operation that people consider is a very important part of the security of deaths, and, and in this case, simplified deaths. So they define which character we're going to replace our uh, input characters with. So the same way that, um, what, similar to the Playfair cipher. The Playfair cipher, we looked at two characters at a time, and we had some matrix that told us to replace these two characters with these other two characters. And we had some rules. We look at the same row and column. We have some similar concepts here. Of the, the matrix tells us, when we have an input, what to replace it with and produce the output. So S box S0 is this matrix on the left. And the input, we can think, currently we have four bits as input. Think of them as bits 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the way to obtain the output is to bits, bit 1 and 4 of the input, the first and last bit of the input, tell us the row of the matrix. And the middle two bits, 2 and 3, tell us the column of the matrix. And we just do a lookup, and the element at that row and column tells us the output, two bits. So in fact, takes four bits in, produces two bits out. And again, like the permutation boxes, the S boxes are constant. It's always this matrix, and it's known. And the same in real desk. There's an S box. In fact, there are, I think, eight S boxes. They're bigger than this, but they're matrices. We can think of them 
and they are known and constant. Now, when we talk about specify the row and column, count in from 0 to 3. So that is, the first row is row 0. Row 1, row 2, row 3, column 0, 1, 2 and 3. And therefore use the input to determine which row and column to look up. Our input is 0, 1, 1, 0. And we'll do it just for that case. We've got 0, 1, 1, 0. That's the left half here. So, bit 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the rule, the rule is that the row is taken from bits 1 and 4. That is, in binary, 0, 0. Or in decimal, row 0. And the column is from bits 2 and 3. In our case, 1, 1. Column 3, which is in fact the last column. The first row in our matrix and the last column in the matrix. Look it up and you'll get the output. What's the output? Rows 0, 0, column 1, 1. So in this matrix, row 0, 0 is the top row. Column 1, 1 is the last column. The element is this one here, 1, 0. So the output is 1, 0. Just be careful. We think row 0, 1, 2, 3, column 0. 0, 1, 2, 3. 1, 0 is the output. And I'll just note here that the output here will be 1, 0 of the first S box. Try it for S box S1. Same rules, but a different matrix. Just check that you, you follow that. This is just a way to implement a substitution. Replace some of the some input characters with others. What's the answer for S1? What do you get? S1 produces something as output. Four bits in, two bits out. Which row? The second row, or row one, row number one. Which column? The last column. The fourth or row, a uh, column three. It gets confusing. We start our numbering at zero. And produces one, one as output. Because bit 1 and bit 4, 0, 1, the, actually the second row, 1, 1 is the last column, we looked that up in our matrix, second row, last column, 1, 1 is the element that comes out here. So this is an important part, that this is the, a, a substitution, and again it's fixed, but it turns out it's an important part of the security of, of real deaths. Just have a quick look at those matrices, do you see any structure in them? Who come up with them, or how do they come up with them is another question. Okay. Well, we cannot think, we do not really know what the designers did a long time ago, but it turns out, with real deaths, it's similar. There's a, a defined matrix. 
It turns out that most people think that the matrices used in DES, and we'll show them later, we'll see them, are designed to make it very hard to go back to obtain the key from the ciphertext. Okay, so there's some non-linear substitution. It's very hard to write an equation, especially for real desks where the matrices are much larger, to write an equation that, a linear equation that uh, allows you to find the, the input given the output. That is, to go in the reverse direction. And in real desks, it turned out people have done analysis that says that if you modify the S boxes just a little bit, maybe you have a slightly different one. Instead of 1, 1, 1, 0, you swap them. People have done analysis of real desks such that when they make small changes, it makes the cipher much less sec secure, much worse which suggests that it was designed to make it more secure. That is, it is a good design. So, as far as people know, uh, the design of DES and the S boxes in particular are quite secure. So the people who designed them apparently designed them to, given uh, what they knew about ciphers at the time, to defeat any of the known attacks. And Apart from the key size, even today, there are no practical attacks on real deaths. No known attacks. Because the key is so small in deaths. So the cipher, the algorithm is strong, but because in real deaths it uses a, say, 64-bit key, you can just try all possible keys. And I'll show you an example that uh, it may cost a few thousand dollars today to, to break real deaths. Brute force. Brute force. Yeah. Correct. Brute force, because 2 to the power of 56 really is, is not so much now for today's computers. But the algorithm is strong. If they had used a different key length, a longer key, it could still be uh, considered secure. Of course, we're just doing it for simplified deaths but the same concepts apply. Let's try and finish our uh, encryption, at least the first part. Where did we get to? We got to here, we got, sorry, here. Two S boxes produce two bits out each. Combine them and apply P4. Take those four bits, apply P4, I'll let you look it up. It's defined on one of the slides, the permutation, and you get 0, 1, 1, 1. It's just a rearrangement of those four bits. XOR those four bits with the original left half that came out of the initial permutation. So coming back to the start, we had four bits on the left and on the right. Take the four bits on the left and X all them with the four that we just got. That's somewhere up here. I don't know if I can draw it. These four bits. We haven't used them yet. Okay, so we use them now. It comes down here and we X all. Was it one zero one zero? We get one one zero one. Almost there. We're at this point. We have four bits. Take the original four bits on the right from the output. We've already used them, but we'll use them again. And combine them, and we get really eight bits. So the four bits we currently have, plus four bits from the right. And then this, this switch, or swap, swaps those two halves. So 
So what we do is we take the right half of IP, this half, and it comes down and we use that. What was it? 1001. So we have 8 bits. In fact, this is the end of the, the round. In our picture, it's denoted as FK. Some function has just finished there. Then we do a swap of those two halves. And the swap is easy. We just take the, the left four bits, they become the right four bits, and we swap over here. Then what do we do? We apply FK again. Where did FK start? I should have drawn, drawn that on here. If I can fit it in. Our function FK started here. If we just look back at our picture, this outer grey box FK takes the input 8 bits from the initial permutation and the output is 8 bits. We feed that into the swap. Those 8 bits are then applied into the exact same function, except we'll use K2 as an input. Everything in here is identical. And we'll get 8 bits out. That's your homework to do that. <laughs> FK started here and finished here, the first iteration. In fact, we may denote that with K1, key 1, and key 2. Sorry, K1 finished here. And then we started again. FK, same function, but use K2. This is the end. And you'll go through that same operations, permutations, substitutions, XOR, use K2 as an input. Remember, we've got K2 from the key generation up here, these 8 bits. I'll stop there and then FK2 will end and at the end the 8 bits out I'll tell you because I've done it before the, la the 8 bits at the end will be 1110 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. last step So you can check those intermediate steps here, okay, if you want to. Last thing we do is the inverse initial permutation. We re rearrange those 8 bits and what's the inverse initial permutation you'll find that and I'll give you the answer 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 that is our ciphertext That's what you should end up with. So this, inside the purple blocks, the function is a round. It's in fact the same as in each round, we do the same code, but we just have different inputs. In between the rounds, we swap the halves. And at the start of the encryption, we apply an initial permutation, and at the end, we apply the inverse of that. Your challenge is 
If you want to check, if you don't understand, I suggest you do this. But if you understand, that's okay. Then try and find what is the inverse initial permutation. You get ciphertext and when, then we're done. So I gave you the output here. We apply IP inverse and we get 8-bit ciphertext. If you want to really check, then you decrypt. And note that decryption is exactly the same. The same steps, that is. We take our ciphertext, inverse, uh, sorry, initial permutation, exactly the same rearrangement of bits. The function fk, which involves expand and permutate, XORs, S boxes, and so on, using k2 in the first round. So this is the first round of the decryption. We use k2, swap the halves, apply the second round using k1 where K1 and K2 are identical to what the encryptor used. Do the inverse initial permutation and you must get the original plain text. If you don't, you've done something wrong. We'll stop there. What we'll do in the next lecture is now then we'll return to real deaths and just compare simplified versus real deaths and really, really just see that real deaths, we just scale up, things are bigger, but the same concepts are applied. And then we'll talk about the security of real deaths and, and some of the known attacks uh, uh, and some of the design issues with real deaths. Try and find in, inverse initial permutation, try and understand what the inverse means in that case. Enough for today. <laughs>